As many of you know, we are in the process of interviewing for a couple of roles here at Lakeside. And you've probably been in that situation, either on one side of the desk or the other. You're either pouring over resumes and cover letters, or you're having your resume critiqued. What would you look for in a candidate? That's always the big question. What do we look for in a candidate? And there's a number of different models that are used. One of them is character, chemistry, and competency. Is this a person of character, of integrity, of reliability, of honesty? And then there's chemistry. Do they fit with the uh, culture and the ethos of our organization? Will they get along with our team? And then, of course, there's competency. Can they do the job? Are they qualified? And depending on the level of responsibility, that process can be pretty intense. You can be put through a whole barrage of psychological or personality testing. In today's passage, we see Jesus going through that very process, selecting his inner circle, those that he is going to mentor. You might say his leadership team. And their role is to carry out the mission of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, to make sure, to ensure that this movement continues long after Jesus is gone. And in this narrative of Luke, the story that we are going through, we've reached a bit of a pivotal point in the story. Up until now, we've looked at Jesus' remarkable birth, we've seen his surprising ancestry, his extraordinary baptism, uh, his intense 40 days of temptation, uh, his sensational miracles, and of course, those charged um, exchanges with the religious elite. Today, the narrative takes a slight turn, and we're gonna see from here on in, Jesus' teaching become more and more intense. His fame is going to grow. He's gonna gather more and more followers. He's gonna begin to teach in parables, as we'll see in a couple of weeks. But let's see for today how this begins to roll out. If you're following along in your Bibles, we're reading from Luke chapter six, and we're picking up at verse 12. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Translation. It's just one of the many English translations available to us. You can follow along in your Bibles, your Bible app, but it'll also be on the screen if you want. Luke 6, verse 12. Now during those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, and his brother Andrew and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Some of you may have heard that little rhyme in Sunday school if you spent any time in church. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. I think you'd agree with me that this is a pretty high-level appointment, carrying on the ministry and the mission of Jesus. It has global implications, and so the selection process requires tremendous wisdom and discernment. Jesus didn't use the Berkman or the Taze or the Myers-Briggs or any of those tools. He stayed up all night and he prayed. He pulled an all-nighter to hear from God, paying attention to the nudging of God, the guidance of God. And at the end of this nocturnal prayer vigil, Jesus selects 12. The resumes are short. They basically have no education, no experience for said job, no chemistry and questionable competency and character. There's not a lot going on for these candidates. Peter would deny him, Judas would betray him, and the rest would desert him in his time of need. Does it make you wonder what that exchange was like through the night? As Jesus was listening for the voice of God and trying to discern who of all these followers should he choose? What did he hear from God? What was God up to? to choose such a ragtag bunch like this. Misfits, it would seem, for this leadership team. Dudes with little character, chemistry, or competency. Can you imagine the dialogue <laughs> at the end of a long night? Like, 
Seriously, God? Like, not him. I'll go with the 11. I'll go with just 11 if we can just leave Judas out of this. They're all unreliable. They're gonna desert me. You can't be serious. There's a hundred others to choose from. Why this 12? And then imagine in the morning, as he's coming down off this mountain tired (laughs) with these 12 dudes around him, stayed up all night. He's probably thinking to himself, I stayed up all night for this? What kind of succession plan is this? (laughs) After all, I prayed all night and I am going to die and leave these guys in charge? But these choices weren't an accident, they were deliberate. Judas wasn't an accident. Jesus had invited his enemy into his inner circle. He'd invited his enemy to be at his table with him. We're probably gonna unpack that in the weeks to come, but that's just a thought exercise maybe for around your lunch table today. Who invites your enemy into your inner circle? You won't find that in any leadership books these days. So Jesus has just named this new leadership team and doesn't fit the accepted norms, doesn't fit leadership the old way. It's an unexpected team and it fits with everything else that we've seen of Jesus' life thus far. And if this this is your first time joining us, whether you're online or in the building, we're going through a series called Unexpected Jesus. And we're looking at Jesus through the lens of one of his, you might say, biographers. We're looking at him through the lens of Luke. And hopefully we're looking at Jesus and his life with fresh eyes. And if you have been tracking with us, we'd be interested to hear what's the most unexpected thing you've encountered thus far? Either something Jesus did, something Jesus said. We'd love to hear. You can text that same number or you can put it in the chat. If you're watching online, we would just be interested to hear what unexpected thing in Jesus' life has grabbed you thus far. Luke says he came down with them. Now, we need a little bit of context here. Jesus went out to the mountain and he came down from the mountain. Now, we've heard allusions like this before, haven't we? Doesn't that ring in your ears? Martin Luther King Jr. saying, I've been to the mountain. Then he comes down with this vision. In this region of Israel, it's, there's a lot of hill country. But Luke chooses the language of mountain. And it's got powerful symbolism to it. He recalls the event in their history when Moses, their great liberator, goes up to the mountain and receives what? Receives the Ten Commandments. He receives the laws and the instructions that will actually form them as a nation. And then he comes back down. This was his manifesto or his charter for the people of Israel. And it distinguished them as the people of God. So this symbolism of Jesus going up the mountain and coming back down isn't lost on Luke's audience. They know that something grave is going to be said, something powerful, something new. They recognize the weight of this. This this new charter that Jesus is coming with is going to distinguish the Jesus way. This new world order, this kingdom of God that he had declared a few weeks earlier. Then Luke adds, and then he came down with them. Now it's just a tiny little conjunction with, conjunctions don't get a whole lot of attention usually, unless you're doing your PhD in Hebrew. It's not a big deal, but Luke adds it. And you'd think that maybe Jesus would come down the mountain and he'd kind of stand back a little bit. And he'd have some facial disclaimers like, this wasn't my idea. (laughs) My hiring committee really screwed up on this one. Honestly, this wasn't my decision. But he came down, Luke says, with them. There was some solidarity there. And he stood in front of all of the other disciples who were probably looking at these dudes going, seriously, this is your lead team? And then he's looking at the multitudes who have come for help and for healing. And and he's thinking, these are the guys who are going to help these folks when I'm gone. Those are the ones who are going to be responsible to carry on my ministry. I wonder if Jesus ever had a panic attack. This might be the time. But Jesus was practicing. He was actually enacting what he's about to preach. Jesus is, is now a cultural icon. 
His fame has reached as far north as Tyre and Sidon. We've got non-Jews coming down to hear him and to see him and to be healed by him. Someone with this kind of power is going to naturally command an audience, an audience who expects him to rise to power, which makes the choice of his disciples or his apostles, as Luke calls them, his lead team, all the more puzzling. And it hints that Jesus' way is gonna be radically different than anything they've seen before. So here he is, having healed all, as Luke says. He's got this captive audience, and they're ready to hang on every word. And he launches into the most unexpected and unpopular sermon recorded in the New Testament, which ironically becomes the most famous sermon. In Matthew's gospel, we know it as the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's gospel, it's known as the Sermon on the Plain. Was it one event or was it two? Was it the the same event, only just Matthew tells it one way, Luke tells it another way, depending on the audience? Kind of like a collection of Jesus, you know, top hits. We may never know. But it's quite likely like a TED Talk or, or, you know, one of those safety talks that you give. So basically the same content, you just adapt it for your various audiences. But this this sermon, this manifesto, this charter is a charter for God's new world order. It's what Jesus calls the kingdom of God or this new creation. It's, It's how God would like the world to be ordered. Dallas Willard, a a giant in spiritual formation and a brilliant author has said this, the kingdom of God is where what God wants done is done. Where God, where what God wants done is done. You'd think that would be an easy sell. Wouldn't everyone want what God wants? Problem is Jesus arrives on the scene to a culture deeply embedded in a worldview. They have built this fortress of belief that defined blessing as having it all together. If you had a robust bank account, then that was God's blessing. If you had health, that was an obvious sign that God was pleased with you. If you had lots of kids and great crops and, and, and lots of livestock, well, God's on your side. If you were happy and you didn't have any worries, then, you know, hashtag blessed. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Which meant that the opposite was true, though. If you were poor, if you were marginalized, if you were an outsider, then God mustn't like you. God mustn't favor you. And then if God doesn't like you and God doesn't favor you, why should anyone else? Jesus has blown everyone away with his radical methods of healing, his controversial choice of a lead team, his unorthodox claims to be God, and now he is going to blow up their worldview with a few short, pithy statements. He's gonna turn everything on its head. And so it's like he's gathered this leadership team and now he's gonna roll out his vision, his charter for the kingdom of God. And this is the vision known as the Beatitudes. Luke lists only four, Matthew lists eight. So you'll be glad that we're in Luke and not Matthew this morning. But the word Beatitude means state of utmost bliss. That's what it actually means. So keep that word in mind as we read through these Beatitudes. They're hard to hear and they're easily misunderstood. We're picking up in Luke six, starting at verse 20. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, blessed or how blissful are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed, how blissful are you who are hungry now for you will be filled. Blessed, how blissful are you when you weep now for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you and defame you on account of me, the son of man. It's really crucial to note in these opening verses on the Sermon on the Plain, that this is not a to-do list. This is a good news list. This is Jesus describing who has the most to gain from the kingdom of God. He's not prescribing what we must do to enter the kingdom of God. 
In other words, Jesus isn't prescribing how to be blessed, but rather describing who is blessed. He's describing, in a sense, a landscape of a new reality. So I don't know if you've ever stood on the shores of Guelph Lake or one of the Great Lakes or the ocean, or you've stood in the Rocky Mountains or at the edge of the Grand Canyon, and the view is breathless. It, it, it catches your breath. You, you feel as though you're standing in a new reality, an alternate reality. It's like, it's like all the worries and the cares and the, and the busyness and the struggles of life just seems to melt away as you step out of one life and you step into this other reality that unfolds before you. This is what Jesus is doing. He's describing an alternate reality for the downtrodden, the marginalized, the ostracized, the minority groups, the hurting and the hungry. He's saying, God is for you. Like we sang this morning, there's a place for you. In these Beatitudes, Stanley Hauerwas, another giant, said this, vision is the necessary prerequisite for ethics. In other words, vision sets the agenda. When we have a vision for this, then we know what the agenda will be. Who are included? Who are honored and blessed in the kingdom of God? And who are at risk? Which we're gonna cover a little later. Scott McKnight has said that Jesus blesses those whom no one else will bless. This new kingdom or this way of Jesus is not about a new set of rules, isn't that a relief? But a new way of seeing and being and valuing. It challenges our values and our value system. And we risk missing this. Because you see, Jesus doesn't just tweak their worldview. He doesn't make an adjustment here and there, he blows the whole thing up. He flips the scales on what God values. And it stands to reason that what God values, God's people should value. Who God blesses, God's people should bless. He says, blessed or how blissful are you who are poor, who are hungry, who weep, who are, he who are hated. Jesus might as well have said, Blessed, happy are you. Congratulations to the bankrupt and the homeless, to the, to the starving and the grieving. Imagine you're in that crowd and you're hearing that. It's, it's, it's against everything you've ever learned. It would have got their attention. If they're there and they're in a situation where they're hungry and they're grieving and they're ostracized, imagine hearing those words. And if they're not, imagine how unsettled they would be hearing those words. But, but Jesus isn't suggesting masochistically that being destitute and mourning and tucking kids into bed hungry at night is a good thing. That is not what Jesus is saying. So why does it sound like it? You see, his audience are used to Beatitudes. It's, it's a way of writing. Um, it's part of their wisdom literature. They're blessing statements. They're like, cause and effect, sort of advice for life, general advice. If you do this, then this. For example, in Proverbs, it says, blessed is the one who listens to me, for whoever finds me finds life. In another place, it says, obey your parents and your life will go well. I'm gonna say that again in case there's any kids in the room. Obey your parents and it will go well. Don't answer the foolish arguments of a fool or you will become as foolish as they are. These are some of the wisdom statements that they're used to hearing. They're used to this, do this and expect that kind of teaching. But Jesus flips this completely upside down. These beatitudes don't, rec don't represent conventional wisdom. They're completely unexpected. You could say they're anti-beatitudes actually. He's not saying if you do, but rather who you are. And maybe some cultural context could be helpful here because these beatitudes really do sound rather bizarre. 
In the ancient Mediterranean culture, poor wasn't just defined as your income. That did have a place to play in it, but it wasn't solely about your income. It was much broader. It included things like your family heritage, your gender, your religious purity, your vocation. Poor meant lower status, meant exclusion, meant lack of honor. And similarly rich, it definitely did include your economic status, but it wasn't strictly restricted to that. It meant that you were an insider socially. You had friends, you had family, you got invited to the dinner parties and the play dates. You enjoyed inclusion in the community. You see, you could, so poor was those on the outside of society. Rich was those on the inside of society. But you could be wealthy and get leprosy. And now all of a sudden, your wealth doesn't matter. You're not rich anymore. You're on the outside of your family and your community. You would be considered poor. You could be a woman from an affluent home with an affluent husband, and if you're childless in that, in that cultural context, you would be regarded as poor. Jesus is painting a picture of a society, a kingdom in which the poor and the hurting and the disenfranchised are favored, and by extension, those who side with them, those who embrace them, those who bring them into their circle. And if Jesus' life is any indication at all, God's heart is for those who are excluded, those we exclude, those who don't share our skin color or our postal code or our sexual orientation or our worldview or our beliefs. Will Willimon has said, the principal lesson of the kingdom is that God breaks in at the weak places. And maybe you've experienced the opposite. Jesus' people who've excluded you. Jesus' people who pretend not to see you. Jesus' people who walk on the other side of the street. Later, Jesus' brother James will write these words, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in Jesus if you favor some people over others? Do we wanna find God? Do we wanna experience God? I do, I think that's why we come here Sunday after Sunday. Then go where God is. Be with those whom God is with. Notice Jesus says of the poor, yours is the kingdom of God. This is present tense. This isn't heaven when you die. It's here already. Jesus had said that when he declared his mission statement in Nazareth and he said, I have come with good news for the poor to release the captives, to let the prisoners go free, to declare that today is the day of freedom. It's where what God wants done is done. Think about that. As communities of, of faith, we are outposts of this new society where the non-physical, invisible realm of God is made physical, is made visible in us. When people look at us as we do life together, as we meet here, but also as we do life together outside of these walls, they should see us as a place, a people, where what God wants done is done where who God loves are loved. For the grieving and the hungry, he offers hope. This isn't blind optimism. This isn't the power of positive thinking. This is biblical hope based on the promise that this is not all there is, that this story is going somewhere, that at some point all will be well. You see, this story, the Jewish faith gave birth to the Jesus story. And that story was always going somewhere. It was always going towards an end where all will be well. And some of you here today or some of you watching may feel trapped in a cycle of misfortune. Nothing seems to be getting better. Jesus is promising that it will, it will. One day, your hunger will be satiated. Whatever that is, is it emotional hunger, physical hunger, spiritual hunger? It will be satisfied. One day, your tears 
will turn to joy. And here's the thing. In Jesus, that future has broken in now. It's in the present. We are to be living the future now. It's what God blesses. Do you want to be blessed? I want to be blessed. Be near, include those whom God blesses. This new world order, this new society is not just for the happy, clappy, have it all together people. In a society built on privilege and power, that's not the kingdom of God. It's for the marginalized, it's for the doubters, it's for the hungry, it's for the grievers, it's for the where are you when I need you lamenters. That's who the kingdom of God is for. The ones hated and ostracized and left out for the sake of Jesus. There's hope for you. You will be full and you will laugh again. Why? Because your pain and your hunger is going to be shared by your community of faith. You will have an inner circle. You will have a place of belonging. Your situation or your unfortunate circumstances don't disqualify you for the kingdom of God. They actually qualify you. This new ethic says, God is all the more for you because life has been against you. The scales of value are tipped in your favor. But Jesus doesn't stop there. (laughs) He takes it one step further. Brace yourselves. He said, woe to you who are rich, for you have received your reward. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. What does he mean by that? Woe, woe, woe. W-O-E, woe, is the Greek word oye. And it's it's a type of expletive. It's very strong language. Luke is going to use it 15 more times in his gospel. Remember now, the rich are those on the inside. Those with money, power, pride, privilege, and place. By inference, at the expense of the poor, those on the outside, those who are hungry. Saying, you've received your reward. There's nothing else. You're not gonna benefit from God's new world order of justice and equality and equity and distribution of wealth and power. And that's uncomfortable for us. But Jesus speaks more about wealth and poverty and inclusion than he speaks about anything else. To the full, we hear the echo of the prophet Amos who said these words. He was railing against Israel for their decadence and their their oblivion to the poor. And he says this, hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Mark asked the question, I wonder what it would take to get me fired. Socks and sandals, an affair, posting something inappropriate. I think if he stood up here one Sunday and said, you cows of Bashan, that might get him fired or at least start him down that road. But this is what the prophet says, you cows of Bashan, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring me something to drink. This is a picture of decadence and indulgence. Opulently dressed women reclining on Shea lounges, snapping their fingers, asking their husbands to bring them drinks, gorging themselves at the expense of the poor, laughing, laughing. Laughing isn't bad. Laughing's really good. But the inference in this context is that the laughing is at the expense of others. The opulence is at the expense of others. Grossly indulging in willful oblivion to the needs of others. That's what Amos was railing against. Fun fact, the word laughing here is the only time it's used in the New Testament. And when it's used in the Greek version of the Old Testament, which was Jesus' Bible, it has the inference of haughty or ironic or flippant or mockery. In other words, laughing in the presence of injustice, mocking the disenfranchised, deserves reversal. It flies in the face of God's values. Luke goes on. Jesus goes on, woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. 
This is a counterpoint to what we hear, what we heard in the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when people hate you on account of me. Jesus lived a justice so foreign, so in a sense offensive to his culture and his faith tradition that it got him killed at the hands of his culture and his faith tradition. This, this is who we follow. So should we expect anything less? Should we be surprised when we face opposition, even from our faith tradition, for following Jesus, for taking risks, for, for reaching out to those whom no one else blesses, to those who are left out? He's saying, if you're rejected for doing this, you're probably doing something right. Friends, what if Jesus' inaugural address, his mission statement, I have come to bring good news to the poor, I've come to give sight to the blind, to release the captives and to set the prisoners free. And you might get tired of hearing that, but it's Jesus' mission statement. And if it's Jesus' mission statement, it ought to be our mission statement. But what if that mission statement and the Beatitudes are really a picture of who God is rather than a list of stringent rules? What if... What if most of the Bible's message is about who God is and not about what we're supposed to do? And what if, as author Sky Jathani says, the underlying sickness afflicting Christians today isn't that we take Jesus too seriously, it's that we don't take him seriously enough. Jesus is laying out this vision, this unexpected vision, this upside down vision It's the groundwork for what is yet to come. And as we go along through the book of Luke, we're gonna see the implications of these beatitudes. We're gonna see them lived out in practice. What it looks like to live the beatitudes, to live the mission statement of Jesus. And here at Lakeside, we are on a mission to help people discover and fully follow Jesus. And the Jesus we want them to discover is the Jesus of the Beatitudes. The Jesus that we are trying to follow, the Jesus we want them to follow is the Jesus of the Beatitudes. The Jesus who sides with the outsider. And I just wonder if we can pause for a few moments and just invite the Holy Spirit to help us reflect on some questions in light of these beatitudes, in light of Jesus' mission statement. Let me ask you, as I ask myself, who are the outsiders in your life, in our city, in our neighborhoods? Who would you struggle to have at your dinner table? Lakeside, how do we as Jesus followers and as a church not only make room for those who are on the outside, but actually make insiders out of outsiders? How do we bless those that the world discards and disposes of? Are we those whom Jesus says are blessed? Or do we need to hear him say, woe, woe to you? Is there someone in your life that you've resisted? And where might God be nudging you to step out? offer an embrace, to offer a place. We just sit with that for a moment. hope you'll ponder these questions. 
hope you'll talk about them in the ride home, around your dinner table, your lunch table, as you walk the dog. <laughs> I'd like to leave you with a benediction. It's what we love to do here. The worship team this morning sang a blessing over you. And every week we want to leave you with a blessing. We want to send you out with the blessing of God. So may the amazing grace of Jesus Christ and the extrav extravagant love of God and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit go with you as you leave here and as you go out into the week great week lakeside we have prayer ministers at the front who would just love to pray with you we love you i look forward to seeing you again soon and maybe even at the barn this evening bless you